This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a comedy, sci-fi film called Mars Attacks. Spoilers ahead. Watch out, and take care. In Lockjaw, Kentucky, a family watches in terror as a herd of burning cattle run on the streets. Not long after, a flying saucer soars into space and heads back to Mars. Moments later, a fleet of saucers emerges from the barren Martian ground and flies toward Earth. A day later, US President James Dale learns about the thousands of saucers surrounding the planet, so he calls his aides and top generals to a meeting. General Decker advises the president to prepare to engage the fleet, but Professor Donald Kessler argues that the aliens cannot be hostile because they belong to an advanced civilization. Dale asks his press secretary, Jerry Ross, to prepare a speech to address the nation regarding the spaceship's arrival. The president interrupts all TV programs to deliver his speech. Dale announces that the Hubble telescope discovered a fleet of spaceships coming from Mars and expresses his hope that humans will soon meet the aliens in peace. In New York, Natalie Lake informs her boyfriend Jason Stone that she will be interviewing Kessler later. Jason, a news anchor, is disappointed that his team didn't schedule an interview with Kessler first. In Perkinsville, Kansas, Richie Norris arrives in his trailer home and finds his brother, Billy Glenn, assembling a rifle while blindfolded. Their father tells Richie that Billy Glenn is volunteering to be a part of the military unit on the ground when the delegates welcome the Martians to Earth. In Washington, D.C., Louise Williams spots her two sons playing an arcade shooting game while she is driving a bus. She makes an unscheduled stop to fetch her sons, Cedric and Neville, to take them to school. Soon, Kessler arrives at the studio for his interview with Natalie. When the program starts, Natalie asks Kessler why Earth's space probes didn't find any life form on Mars when it passed by the planet. Kessler explains that Martians developed their civilization under the surface of Mars because of their advanced technology. Jason watches the interview from his office and gets jealous when he notices that Natalie is flirting with Kessler. The technicians at the studio are alarmed when the signal on the TV is suddenly disrupted. As a Martian appears on the screen, Natalie and Kessler embrace each other. First Lady Marcia Dale is terrified by the Martian's appearance, so she tells her husband that she won't let it inside the White House. The President, however, argues that they may have to do it anyway because the people will expect him to meet the aliens. When the Martian draws a circle in the air with his fingers, Richie naively remarks that the alien just made the international sign of the donut. During an emergency meeting, Kessler discloses that the Martians are carbon-based life forms that breathe nitrogen. He surmises from the size of their cerebrum that they have the potential to communicate telepathically. When Dale asks about the aliens' intentions, Kessler assures him that they are peaceful and enlightened because they come from an advanced culture. Another scientist brings out a machine that is supposed to translate the Martians' broadcast. However, no one could make sense of the translated message. Back in Nevada, Barbara Land shares her progress in her Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. She's been sober for three months, and she's more optimistic because of the Martians. She expresses her belief that the aliens arrived to save the planet from environmental destruction and show humans how to live sustainably. Soon, Richie and his family send Billy Glenn off to Nevada to be part of the military detail for the Martians' arrival. After Billy Glenn leaves, Richie drives his grandmother Florence back to the nursing home. When they get to her room, Florence pets her stuffed cat and plays Slim Whitman's Indian Love Call on her record player. While Byron Williams is jogging in the streets, Barbara's husband, Art, asks him to get in his limousine. Art tells Byron, a former boxing champion, that he'll pay him $2,000 to beat up somebody who owes him money. However, Byron notes that he only fights with people inside the ring. He contends that he's a changed man, and he's trying to keep out of trouble to get back with his wife, Louise. Dale assigns General Casey to meet with the Martians in Pahrump, Nevada. The next day, the military, the media, and many civilian spectators arrive at the site to welcome the Martians. Soon, a spaceship emerges from the clouds and lands near the end of the red carpet prepared by the delegates. When the Martian ambassador comes out, Casey offers to shake its hand, but the alien ignores the gesture. So, Casey greets it by drawing a circle in the air. The President and Kessler are relieved when the Martian repeats the gesture. Casey then introduces himself and welcomes the Martians on behalf of all humans. When the Martian ambassador responds, the translating device repeats the message in English. The spectators rejoice when they hear that the aliens come in peace. When a spectator releases a dove, the Martian ambassador gets agitated and shoots it down. The ambassador then turns to Casey and vaporizes him with his ray gun. The military opens fire on the Martians as they start shooting at the civilians. Natalie's media van topples after being hit by the ray gun, so Jason runs over to rescue her. 
Elsewhere, Billy Glenn arms himself with a rifle and bravely charges the Martians, but the clip falls off when he pulls the trigger. He grabs the American flag and surrenders, but a Martian decimates him. His parents are shocked to witness the shooting on TV. Jason manages to crawl towards Natalie and reach out his hand, but Natalie is horrified to discover that the alien's ray gun has reduced his body to a skeleton. The Martians soon return to their ship, taking Natalie and her pet chihuahua with them. As Dale and Marcia stare at the TV in shock, Decker advises the president to nuke the Martians. However, Kessler notes that a cultural misunderstanding probably caused the incident. Dale's daughter, Taffy, agrees and surmises that the dove could symbolize war to the Martians. That night, Dale transmits a message to the aliens through the translating machine. He expresses his hope that the tragic event was only a misunderstanding and assures them that the humans don't want to hurt them. The aliens just scornfully laugh upon reading the message. After hours of staring at a Playboy magazine, the Martian leader turns its attention to Natalie, who's confined to a glass cage. Back on Earth, Art tells his assistant to prepare a limousine for the investors of his new hotel. Barbara is puzzled that Art is still conducting business despite the Martian attack earlier, so Art explains that he's preparing for the future. He knows that the Martians will need a place to stay when they land on Earth. Barbara loses hope for humanity and forgets about her pledge to keep herself sober. She takes a bottle of whiskey before leaving the room. While Kessler examines the body of a dead Martian, the aliens are conducting experiments of their own on their ship. They place Natalie's head in a glass jar and replaced it with the head of her chihuahua. Natalie is horrified upon seeing her body with her pet's head. Byron calls Louise to tell her that he's coming to Washington, D.C. the next day to visit them. When he speaks to Cedric and Neville, they excitedly inform him that they'll visit the White House as a part of the school's tour. That night, Kessel receives a message from the Martians. Jerry relays to Dale that the Martians have apologized and asked him for permission to speak to Congress. Dale doesn't see any problem with the request, seeing it as a victory for his administration. The following day, the military and civilians gather outside the Capitol building to wait for the Martians. After they land, the aliens immediately enter the House chamber and head to the Speaker's podium. When the ambassador reaches the podium, it reads from a tape before firing its ray gun at the lawmakers. Kessler tries to plead with the ambassador, but another Martian knocks him out. The Martians carry him back to their ship and go back into space. During another emergency meeting, Decker pleads with the president to use nukes against the aliens, but Dale refuses and threatens to relieve him from his position. He stresses that everything will go on as usual because the two branches of government are still functional. Dale addresses the nation to tell the Americans that he'll be speaking with world leaders to discuss possible solutions to their Martian problem. In the Martian ship, the aliens continue their experiments on humans. They have detached Kessler's head and put Natalie's head on her chihuahua's body. When Kessler wakes up, Natalie admits that she enjoyed his flirtatious behavior when she was interviewing him the other day. Kessler confesses that he's been watching her show for a while, and he's developed a crush on her. Back in Washington, D.C., a strange-looking woman gets off the bus and walks toward the White House. Incidentally, Jerry arrives in his limousine and notices that the woman seems to be interested in going to the White House, so he brags that he works there as the press secretary. The woman doesn't respond and keeps chewing a piece of gum, but she nods when he offers to take her on a personalized tour. When they get inside, Jerry compliments a woman for her elegance and kisses her hand. Unbeknownst to Jerry, the woman has a camera on her ring, and it's transmitting the video back to the alien ship. Jerry takes the alien to a vacant bedroom and prepares a drink for her. Not long after, Jerry sits down beside the Martian on a couch and starts kissing her. He puts his finger inside her mouth to take her gum, but the alien bites a digit off and spits it into the aquarium. Jerry tries calling for help, but the alien knocks him down. After exiting the room, the alien explores the White House and eventually finds the President's bedroom. She then takes off the human head and tries to fire a ray gun at the sleeping couple, but their dog suddenly barks and wakes them up. The alien shoots the dog but fails to hit Dale. Marsha throws her shoe at the Martian and inadvertently creates an opportunity for Dale to charge at it. However, the alien subdues Dale and takes him hostage. The Secret Service soon arrive, but they can't shoot the Martian while it points a ray gun at Dale's head. The alien leads Dale to another room, where it gets agitated by a small bird. When the Martian shoots the bird, Dale manages to escape from its grasp, allowing the Secret Service to fire at the alien until it's dead. The alien leader is enraged by their assassin's death, so it immediately orders the others to arm themselves and prepare for an all-out assault on Earth. After analyzing the alien's gum, the scientist discovers that it could breathe because it was chewing highly concentrated nitrogen. When the spaceships arrive on Earth, the Martians fire at the Washington Monument while Boy Scouts are passing by. When the Boy Scouts run to get away, the spaceship topples the obelisk in their direction. The saucer topples the monument to the other side again when the Boy Scouts run in the other direction. Inside the White House, a woman conducts a tour for the Williams brothers and their classmates, but a Martian suddenly vaporizes her. The Secret Service engages the Martians in a firefight as the presidential family makes her way to safety. Not far, 
Cedric and Neville come across a dead alien and take its ray guns. Marsha gets left behind as the Secret Service leads the President back to the stairs. A Secret Service agent shoots a Martian approaching her, but the alien fires its ray gun as it falls to the ground. Its rays hit a chandelier that falls on top of the First Lady's head. The President hears the chandelier fall on Marsha and runs back to her as the aliens keep up the attack. While Cedric and Neville shoot the Martians trying to attack Dale, they instruct the Secret Service to take the President to safety. As Art tells his investors about his plans for his hotel, the spaceships arrive. The investors try to call Art's attention, but he ignores them. The Martians destroy the hotel, killing Art and everyone inside. Byron calls Louise to tell him that his flight has been cancelled, but the call is abruptly cut off. Barbara approaches Byron and asks him if he knows anyone who can fly a plane. She discloses that she loaded a plane with supplies because she wants to go to Tahoe, believing that the aliens wouldn't reach him there because it's remote. While Tom Jones performs on stage. He's startled when Alien suddenly replaces backup singers. When the Martians start shooting at the audience, he runs out of the stage and comes across Barbara and Byron. A Martian suddenly breaks into the casino, so Byron knocks it down before it can hurt anyone. Byron, Barbara, Tom, a waitress named Cindy, and a rude gambler make their way out of the casino to get to Barbara's plane. As Dale sits in despair in the war room, he gets a call from the President of France. The French President tells Dale that he's with the Martian Ambassador, and he successfully negotiated a deal. Dale warns the French President to immediately get out of the room, but the Martians are already killing everyone. Later, Dale finally agrees to use nuclear weapons against the Martians. The military fires a missile toward the alien mothership, but the aliens deploy a device that sucks the nuclear blast into a balloon. When the device returns to the mothership, the Martian leader inhales the balloon's contents and laughs. Richie decides to fetch Florence from the nursing home even though his father wants him to stay in the trailer to fight the aliens. When he gets outside, a gigantic robot controlled by an alien grabs her trailer and bashes it against another trailer. Back in Las Vegas, a rude gambler decides to part ways with the group. When he runs into a Martian, he tries to surrender, but the alien kills him. The gigantic robot chases after Richie, but it trips on a wire and falls. In the nursing home, the Martian points a weapon at Florence as she listens to music on her headphones. She accidentally pulls the headphone cord when she hears Richie call out to her. The heads of the Martians start to explode after hearing Slim Whitman's Indian love call blasting on the speakers. Soon, the Martian leader arrives in the war room. Decker fires his guns at them, but the Martian uses a device to shrink him and step on him. In one final plea to the Martians, Dale delivers a speech to convince him to work alongside humans. The Martian leader seems moved by the speech. It sheds a tear and offers to shake Dale's hand, but the hand turns out to be a mechanical weapon that impales the president. Richie and Florence kill all the aliens in their path with Whitman's yodeling as they head to a radio station. Upon their arrival, they immediately broadcast a song across the nation. Byron and his friends soon arrive at the hangar, but they discover that an army of Martians is outside. Byron decides to challenge the ambassador to a fistfight so that the others can escape on the plane. He knocks out a few Martians, but he is eventually overwhelmed by their numbers. Soon, the military and civilians worldwide use a song to kill the Martians. In the mothership, Martian leader's head explodes after hearing the broadcast from Earth. As the ship flies out of control, Natalie's head detaches from the Chihuahua's body and falls to the floor. When her head rolls close to Kessler, she confesses her love to him and says goodbye. The two eventually kiss when their heads roll towards each other. Barbara, Tom, and Cindy soon arrive in Tahoe, where animals interact with them without apprehensions. Days later, Taffy awards Florence and Richie with the Medal of Honor for saving the world from Martians. Not far from Capitol Hill, Byron arrives outside Louise's ruined apartment to reunite with his family. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like, it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.